Over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Lakita, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Scott Marlowe. I'm a uh, very grateful Rafi alumnus and, and um, grateful to be still working with Rafi on this project. Um, as Lakita said, this is a, this is a SARE funded project. I want to uh, just recognize our partners on that project, the North Carolina Agromedicine Institute, the Land Loss Prevention Project, NC State, <clears throat> the National Center for Appropriate Technology, and the farmers who are working with us, Stephen Walker, Leroy Hardy, Martha Calderon, and Russ Vollmer. Um, <clears throat> this project is to look at culturally appropriate resources for farmers who are in extreme financial stress dealing with a lot of the mental health issues. And as we've looked at a lot of the, um, the research on this, this issue, there's a lot out there on farmer mental health. And, and we're, not gonna go, um, we're not gonna go too deeply into some of that that's pretty well established. Um, it's, pretty well, it's well documented. But what's not included in a lot of it is this sense of betrayal, is what happens when the person who the farm family turns to for help actually betrays them and speeds up the loss of the farm. Um, and that can take many different forms. Obviously one of them, the, the most uh, systemic and um, uh, very prevalent is the issue of discrimination in agricultural lending. We're not gonna go into the history of USDA and ag lender discrimination. That is extremely well documented and extremely well established. If you don't know that history or don't believe that that is the history, I'm glad to share with you the internal USDA reports that lay out how, it, how extensive it was and it is. And also there's a whole series of resources that can be looked at. Um, Peter Daniel's book, um, uh, Dispossessed, is an excellent one that lays out the history of discrimination at USDA. What we are going to talk about, though, is what discrimination and this form of betrayal looks like now, how it plays out in cases now, and then what redress farmers have, and eventually what that means in terms of the farmer's mental health and physical health, and, and, and what that means for people who are working with and serving farmers in one of these capacities. I am extremely grateful to have two people who are going to be our presenters today um, who are both have some of the most um, extensive knowledge on um, on casework and what happens in these situations uh, some of the most ex um, experienced in the country <clears throat> Quentin Robinson is a practicing attorney with litigation experience in the field of employment and farm credit discrimination cases he recently um, and, and has done some really groundbreaking legal precedents on behalf of minority farmers and ranchers. He served in a series of leadership capacities um, and including uh, political appointments during the Obama administration, <clears throat> the member of the Georgia State Directors of Rural Development with USDA and the Director of the Office of Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization at the U.S. Department of Ag and um, Assistant Counsel on the House Agriculture Committee. He's also done extensive work on federal ag policy through both the, um, the Rural Coalition and the National Family Farm Coalition, and has been a, a fantastic partner of ours for a long time. Um, Benny Bunting is Rafi USA's lead farm advocate. <clears throat> Benny has served individual farmers since 1983, assisting farmers in financial crisis with financial counseling, representation in administrative appeals, in advocacy on the farmer's behalf to federal agencies and lending institutions. He has served thousands of farms, often making the difference between farm families staying in their homes and on the land or losing all that they have. He has worked on hundreds of cases where discrimination was an issue, including two of the lead plaintiffs in the women's class action lawsuit against USDA. So let me bring in um, Quentin and Benny now. Let's Let's just start from a fairly general question. How prevalent do you see this issue of betrayal being in the cases that you work with? Quentin, let's start with you. Okay. Um, I think 
you know, once you uh, find a farmer and that farmer is in a position of distress, meaning financial stress or distress caused by the manner in which a farmer enters or not enters uh, a farm program or, or a loan program. Uh, once the farmer has the cloud of distress on them, it's sort of like, you know, this, this sign on, that back, on their backs that says, I'm weak, I'm, I'm isolated, so come attack me. And what we see on a consistent basis, and Benny will be able to, uh, to cor corroborate this, is that we see a distressed farmer not being assisted in the most effective manner, but we see distressed farmers being given an even worse deal, an even worse contract agreement, an even worse farm loan terms and conditions than the original farm loan conditions that placed them in distress in the first place. And so we know the whole purpose of this call is to sort of identify some of the terms and conditions of these uh, loans and program um, participation and to alert you know, the stakeholders that these you know, really bad discriminatory uh, terms and conditions do exist. Uh, and to alert the stakeholders that it's not just a signature on a document, it, it's not just um, the black and white language of a contract or loan terms, uh, uh, loan term, meaning financial loan uh, or credit terms on a document. It, 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 you know, what's not in the four corners of those documents is the consequences that can, that, 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 that will happen to the farmer down the road. And so if you give me a bad loan term for my 2020 Mustang 5.0, big deal. I just drive the car very, very fast speeds and eventually I'll pay it off, but with a lot of pain. But if you give me a bad loan term or bad credit conditions on a discriminatory basis, or the operation of my farm, I lose my farm through foreclosure, number one. And then number two, if, if I'm prone for one reason or another to have high blood pressure, uh, high cholesterol or diabetes, then it's a death sentence. Because if I am a farmer and I grew up on this particular land since I was age three, and now you know the farmer may be 63 or 73, or even, what we're seeing now, age 43, we're seeing farmers go behind the barn with the shotgun and they don't come back. And that's because someone, whether it's a lender, a family member, or a government official, betrayed them with the long term, with, with, with terms and conditions that were straight up discriminatory. And others who were not like them were given a better, a more fair deal. To, to survive in a very volatile farm economy. So I'll stop there, uh, Scott, and, uh, and see, you know, uh, and, and just have Benny add to, uh, to your question. Yes, I've, I've seen some of the, the same results that Quentin has had. I actually have three farmers that I've worked with that have not died from suicide but have died from uh, massive heart attacks with no history of you know, a heart condition from just the stress of dealing with financial problems that could have not been bad. You know, the farm economy is bad. These loan officers make it terrible for these farmers that are experiencing financial problems when it could be the opposite, they could be coming in and the rules, you know, have it where the, and especially a government with FSA could come in and assist farmers. And yet it seems to be a rush and not all loan officers, but it seems to be a rush for some loan officers just to know that they are in total control of the financial destiny of this family and just relish keeping them in stress 
and that's 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 unforgivable. I mean, but but we see it, and it does not seem to have rhyme or reason that they just why do they do this? It's just pure discrimination. You know, they just it's just a power rush for them. But uh, these families are are in are in. They're in need of assistance and they don't get assistance and the mental stress that comes from it affects their health. And let's like say, I know three that it is, they have, they have died with massive heart attacks and nothing but stress. So we've mentioned discrimination several times and we know the history of the discrimination cases, the lawsuits against USDA. USDA has said that they've largely cleaned up their act and they don't do the same things that they used to do and things like that. Um, what does discrimination look like now? Well, you know, Scott, and you mentioned the history of this and I think, you know, by now every, everyone on the call you know, you know about Pickford, you know about uh, Keep Siegel, you know about, uh, I think it's Garcia and Love, right? And so those cases really, you know, from a, from a compare and contrast point of view, those cases really dealt with the color of your skin. If you had a, a skin color in those cases that in the, for the most part was, was, was not white, then you got a different you got a different treatment or you got a different uh, terms for a loan than, 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 your, than your counterparts. And what that means is that if I'm growing a crop of sugarcane and it requires that I enter the field to plant no later than March the 15th of every year, and all of the other farmers in my community, they get their loans uh, packages completed, let's say by March the 1st, and they have the loan money to enter the field, to, to cultivate, to spray, no, no later than, 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 than uh, March the 15th. And as an African-American farmer, I enter the, my, my loan package is, is, is not completed and I'm, and I'm not funded until June the 15th. Well, not, not probably, but my crop will fail. And when I get the loan money almost three months late, I'm under the same requirement to repay that loan with the, the, the weather being against me, with the bugs being against me, and with the prices of the sugarcane being against me because I got to the field late. And so to, to directly answer your question, Scott, discrimination now doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, one, one deal for a black farmer or, or one deal for uh, a, a white farmer. Discrimination now is, is about what's on the, what's on the paper, what's, what's, on the, what's happened in the electronic file that caused uh, the information that one farmer received, which is, you know, top level great information versus poor level information that another farmer received because, you know, of their uh, uh, racial makeup, because of gender makeup, uh, because, and because of their age. And so, so discrimination now is, is about, not about whether or not you got the loan, but when you got the loan, and what were the terms and conditions? And what I mean when I say that is, did you give me the same loan terms and conditions that you gave someone who did not fit within my category? So that's, that's this new form of discrimination. And it's, it's as painful as um, uh, uh, discrimination of the past. And as we've already stated, it will kill you. It will send you to your grave because the stress is so great uh, that you you know your it, it will increase the the impact of your existing health conditions, or you might decide to to say you know it's not worth it. I'll just I'll just blow my brains out, and we are seeing a lot of that. And and I've seen it even 
that's pretty blatant. I've seen a lot of more covert discrimination, and I think that's what it is, you know, uh, coming on. I've got one that dealing with, with a uh, uh, young farmer, and this was a beginning farmer uh, that was going in uh, for a loan. He had irrigation on his facility. So the loan officer actually uh, encouraged him to save money. Don't bother with getting insurance because you're protected from drought. You've got irrigation and that's the only thing that you're gonna be protected from. In this case, there was linkage with disaster assistance. The loan officer had to know all of these situations. You know, there was not only drought, but with drought comes insect infestation and all this stuff. And he was not protected from any of that if he didn't get insurance and he was not eligible for disaster assistance because he didn't have insurance. He ended up losing the farm, but the farmer actually thought that the FSA guy was helping him. He could not, rec you know, he did not recognize that he was being discriminated against in a covert way. Uh, and to me, it was discrimination because he was, the loan officer knew that. Insurance was vital to that operation. Uh, I've got another one where I think it was covert. And this was just a few months ago that um, a loan was being a approved it was expedited uh, after we had filed a discrimination complaint but uh, they wanted to close the loan and in this particular case there needed to be a contract in hand you know for the uh, for eligibility FSA was going wanted to close the loan that day and I told I had to if I had not been there, it probably would have been closed. But I told the, the farmer that, look, the minute you sign that note now that you're, and you're obligated to it, but you immediately become a non-monetary default, then I think she would be subject to the agency's retaliation then immediately, you know, for being a non-monetary default and be looked at as a bad farmer to influence the discrimination complaint. Uh, so we see a lot more covert. I'm seeing a lot of stuff that's covert in things that are happening with the agency, that the agency is smarter in their discrimination now. And so part of what you're saying, Benny, is that the discrimination is becoming indistinguishable from bad, just bad servicing. It's just a bad loan. How does this play out? Like when you, when you start to call them on it, how does it, I mean, USDA will say they only get maybe 250 or so civil rights complaints a year, which is minuscule compared to the number of programs and loans and everything that they do. They'll say that's clear evidence that discrimination no longer happens. How does this, how do the two of you see this play out when you start to see something, a, a case like this that is very subtle? Well, Scott, we, you know, you and I and Benny and, and uh, Rural Coalition, uh, National Family Farm, Savvy down at uh, Land Loss. We worked on this, this as a solution in the Farm Bill and we were successful, as you know, in getting, uh, I think it's uh, 7 USC 2008A uh, passed, which is called uh, Equitable Relief. And so what Benny just described is that maybe just maybe you can't prove discrimination based on race, sex, age, gender, or whatever. You can't prove it, right? But what you can prove is that on the date that the farmer received information from the government loan officer, the FSA agent or the government agent knew that that information was incorrect, false, not applicable. And the farmer, nevertheless, because has it be not because the farmer is not smart, but if the government says, you know, walk in the door, we're here to help, that means that the government has information that's paramount, that's 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 more um, 
accurate, more clear than the farmer. And if the government agency either mistakenly or deliberately gives bad information and that bad information causes the farmer harm in the future in the, farm, in the form of uh, default acceleration and foreclosure, then the provision of equitable relief will kick in and basically say that here's the bad information that was given. It caused the farmer harm. So rather than allowing the harm to go forward, i.e. the foreclosure to go forward, the Secretary of Agriculture has the duty under this new statute to provide the farmer with a form of equitable relief, meaning let's take away the bad consequences of this bad information given by the government and let's go back and work the situation out. And so that is, you know, a policy change, you know, that we were able to get into the law and uh, uh, equitable relief was argued twice within, within uh, 20, 2018. Uh, the administrative law judge says that a provision of equitable, equitable relief is made available immediately for farmers and that a farmer uh, has, a, has a right to rely on information from the government official. And if that information is, inc is incorrect, let's not go the route of foreclosure. Let's go back and rework the loan. And, and Benny will attest to this. A farmer is different from any other business that takes out a loan. If you miss your fertilizing or if you miss your, your spraying at a particular time during the season, your crop is lost for the entire season. But you are responsible for paying back that loan uh, when, it's, when it becomes due. And so like, say, a, a, a business that's not farm related may have a seven year time period to pay back a loan. A farmer is not different. A farmer pays back the loan um, every year unless he gets a loan restructuring. And so a mistake, and this is the point that I want to drive home, a mistake made by a third party, whether it's the bank, the government official, will put a farmer out of business. And so this call is so important because it, it, it allows us to inform the stakeholders that um, we, need to, we need to be on the lookout for these mistakes because they cause foreclosures, they cause health concerns, they cause death, and, and it's just not fair to the people who uh, provide the food and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the clothing, you know, the stuff that they grow on the farm is stuff that we, that we need every single day. And when you, you had had um, you had said before that frequently there are um, there are clauses buried in there. You mentioned before earlier in the call you you were saying you know there's what's in that loan document, and you were saying that sometimes there's stuff in there that may not like in an ownership loan may not become apparent for two or three years down the line, at which point it's completely too late. Right. I, I mean. You know, I'm not, I'm not looking, I'm not looking for extra work, but it, you know, I think, you know, farmers need to have lawyers on hand to take a look at the the terms of the document because, and 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 Scott, you brought this out during the farm bill very very clearly, and and maybe you'll tell this example better that better than I can, if you have a poultry house loan, that's a seven year loan but your poultry contract is only a two-year contract, don't sign that document because you are going out of business. So Scott, you made that very clear and we worked on this. Uh, we have more work to do on that, but, yeah. but that term within that loan document versus your third party poultry integrated contract, that will put you out of business. And, and I think your mentioning of, of the importance of attorneys is a good point. Um, Savvy Horn from our our very close partners at the Land Loss Prevention Project is also on the call. We want to do a shout out to them. They're such important partners on this work. Farmers Legal Action Group, others who are in the trenches on the on the legal issues. Um, uh, and but but Benny, do you want to talk a little bit about how you're seeing some of the the discrimination cases that you've seen? How you see it sort of play out over time? 
Well, I've got one I think I told you earlier. I had actually, it, it's coming to a head because I actually talked to the farmer last night. But this was one where the farmer actually, he got a loan for a startup operation. Uh, he got funded at $120,000, got into the starting the operation up, had spent $63,000 or so. New loan officer comes in and says that the agency is not properly uh, collateralized. Actually, in the record, it says the farmer did nothing wrong. It states it in the record, but they defunded his loan immediately. Even though there was in the file, they you can see when you look into the file, you can see that they, the state office was intent on defunding this loan. They had actually got sent uh, to get permission from the national office. A letter from the national office is in the file and gives them, tells the, the agency that they can defund after all administrative reviews opportunities for the farmer are exhausted. So that means all of his appeal rights are not. They defunded the loan the next day. He never got an opportunity for going into administrative review before he was defunded. This was on air property. Had to go in and get siblings to sign the sign for these property to be put up as collateral for the agency. Now he is set with, and he is not in a good mental state now because nothing that he did improperly, but now he is set to lose this family property. And you know, the, the weight of that is on his shoulder and it shouldn't happen. FSA, some of that has changed now. That's the equitable relief that Quentin was talking about a few minutes ago. But this happened prior to equitable relief being available. And, and I want to point out that the people on this, people who are attending this webinar are probably more educated than most on the ins and outs of USDA programs and things like this. And I would bet money that the number of people who are on this call who have ever heard of equitable relief is probably there are about three people on there who may have heard of it before. This is, and this goes back when to what you were saying about the agency has information, the farmer does not. Farmer doesn't know to ask for, age, for equitable relief. So, so let me, so Quentin, you were talking about earlier how when a farmer gets into trouble, instead of it being a time for help, it becomes a time for predation. And so discrimination for, to, to take advantage of their weakness, to go after their weakness. Discrimination is certainly a major form of that, and a major form of this kind of betrayal, but it's not limited to that. And we also see it in other ways. Can you all speak to sort of other ways that this plays out? We've talked about the agency and lenders to a certain extent, but other ways that this plays out for, for farm families. Right. Um, uh... Ben, Benny, to, I mean, you raise you raise a very important um, uh, effective date of the statute, statute question. Uh, this equitable, equitable relief in the 28 form form bill became effective December 18th, I believe, 2018. But the way the the, the way the language reads is it doesn't say one way or the other. So in other words, the language is silent as to whether a farmer in 1970 can find a mistake and ask for equitable relief or whether the farmer has to be some date after December 18, 2018. So the language in the statute doesn't say one way or the other. And so that just opens a door for, for us as advocates to say the silent language means that you can go back to 1920 and find a mistake and ask for equitable relief. So that's that's what that's what we're gonna do, right? Because the lang the language is silent. Now you may you may have uh, you know the government say no, you know it really meant meant after 2018. But I don't think that that particular question has been presented yet, and I think we need to present it because discrimination and and and, and I think uh, there are some law students on the phone 
that I've been working with this summer. Discrimination in 1936 is just as painful as discrimination in 2020 because the effects of discrimination don't improve over time. They get, the effects get worse because you know, discrimination causes, as we already mentioned, suicides, death, you know, other types of deaths, et cetera, et cetera. And so if we can make this equitable relief statute work, regardless of when the mistake or the discrimination happened, then I think it's, it, we, 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 we're, we're really getting after the question. But Scott, to answer, to answer your question, I'll answer your question with, with, with a real live example that I got that I was confronted with on yesterday. A young farmer, he's 30 years old, college educated, very smart. His father is on his deathbed and he can die any day now. The farm, the farm is worth, the value of the farm abuts a very prominent lake in Georgia where there's like million dollar homes the farmer's probably worth about 800,000. The father is delinquent 130,000. When the father took out the loan, the bank and USDA required the father to have a life insurance policy. And the beneficiary of the life insurance policy is the bank and USDA. So if the father dies, the life insurance policy kicks in, pays off the hundred thirty thousand. The son and the son and his sister, or the son and the daughter, they have in their hands property that's worth worth about eight hundred thousand. The son and the and his sister, they walk into the bank on an annual basis, and we talked about when you pay off uh, farm loans, it's an annual payoff. They walked into the bank in twenty eighteen with twenty thousand dollars to pay the annual note. In 2019, they walk into the bank to pay the annual note of $20,000 and the bank says, no, we're not going to accept your money. They don't accept the money. They place them in foreclosure. And if you're the bank, what would you rather have? The insurance policy of $130,000 or would you rather have foreclosure on the land for $800,000? And so, to answer your question, uh, Scott, it's like the terms, and this is not even a term and condition question. This is a, a farm loan servicing practice that is designed to snatch up an eight hundred thousand dollar farm, rather than allowing the uh, the insurance policy to pay off the hundred thirty thousand. And so it's 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 almost as if you know the young farmer. Um, and this small rural town is, you know, has that target on his back, as we mentioned, because his dad is on his dying bed and, and everybody in the farm, in this farm community realizes that. And they would like to have access to this very, very valuable property. And so, um, so these are, you know, you know, this is just one practice. This is just one practice that I ran into yesterday and 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 Scott, you know, you mentioned another one that was quite comical. I mean, it's really not, it's really not funny. It's really sad. But you know, when you do the type of work that we do, you see people die. You see people commit suicide. You see people lose their the farmland. Then you have to find a way to laugh because it's really depressing to us as stakeholders because that's what we do on a daily basis. But you know, I'm not the moderator, but I'm going to ask you to share with. With, with the participants today, the, um, let's see what we called it. We called it the, uh, a Bible study, the perfect place to steal land. Yeah, this was a story that came from, this is not a case that I worked on. This is a story from a friend where a person, a farmer in the community went into a nursing home and did Bible study all, week, all winter with the women in the nursing home and did Bible studies weekly. And then when it came time to renew farm leases, said to them, now, don't you want your farm farmed by a good Christian who you share these values with? And he took the land out from under a series of other farmers in the community by going into the nursing home and targeting the old women in the nursing home who he knew had, had farmland to lease. 
And he used that opportunity to take the leases out from under other farmers in the community. And it caused huge, it, it caused a great deal of stress and strife among a series of people. But th that's how cutthroat it can get is the using the Bible study to, to, to steal a leasing agreement. Um, and Benny, I know that you've got a, you know, I, I know that you've seen a lot. Um, you want to talk a little bit to this? Well, there, there are a lot of players in this stuff. And, you know, there are a lot of unintended consequences to some of the things we want, such as county committees, you know, and that's just being elected now in FSA. But, you know, and most of the time they're good. But we've actually also seen that the county committee, these are farmers because they're, that's one of the qualifications of being on the county committee is that you're being a farmer. But those farmers are the first to know the farmers, a neighbor farmer is in trouble because, you know, they get the review information. If he gets denied on insurance, he's not going to get insurance. You know, they come up and they'll, they'll, they'll prove it. So we have seen where that has been uh, capitalized on by members of committees uh, where they knew it. So they would have, it's cut through out in the farming, you know, trying to get land. They're not making any more. So they are the first to be to that uh, landlord that was a bat farmer that was getting denied because they knew it. And so they're the first to go in and say, look, we know he's in trouble. He's not going to be able to, don't think he's going to be able to farm next year. If he doesn't, I want to bow my hat. You know, I want to be the first to put it in, you know, that I want to lease that land. I have a farmer that I think we discussed earlier, that same thing. The, and this was a loan officer. FSA loan officer was going to a uh, neighbor's farm to, to hunt. You know, that's where he hunted and in when the farmer got in our farmer got in trouble uh, this was the first farmer in the neighborhood that knew it was going on because he was friends with the loan officer and so he was the first one there and actually ended up with the farm because he had inside information and inside information is <laughs> that gives them a leg up and you know as unintended you know like I say in the county committee we like the county committee we want it to be there but there's still a lot of bad players within the agency and outside the agency that that influence uh, pressure on on farmers so let's take a couple seconds a couple minutes and just get at if a farmer is if a farmer isn't treated unfairly by USDA or by someone else um, aren't there appeals? You can appeal it. You can do a civil rights complaint. How well does that, that system work to, to redress the issues that farmers have? I'll take that first if you, if you don't want to quit me because I like that one because I, I think the, the appeal process is great, but it has been indoctrinated now and changed because we did a Freedom of Information request several years ago. And the request was that if the agency wins the appeal, if the hearing officer rules in favor of the agency and the, the appellate asks for a director review, uh, what is the overturn rate? And uh, three percent. I mean three percent. So that hearing officer is uh, competent, you know, when they rule for the agency. On the other hand, okay, the next question, if, if they rule for the farmer and the agency asks for a review, what is the percent of overturn? And it was 93 percent of the time that they were overturned. So that same loan officer was competent if they ruled for the agency, but totally incompetent if they ruled for the farmer. Next question. 
are reversals of hearing officers a part of their annual performance review? Answer, yes. So what has indoctrinated now? You can't find a, and they're called administrative judges now, but they're, you know, they're still, the, they were the hearing officers and the administrative judges. If they rule for the, the agencies, they know they're gonna, they're gonna be uh, you know, upheld at least 93% of the time. If they rule for the farmer, they're gonna be reversed 97% of the time. What job security, you know, we're all subject to, to wanting to preserve job security. It has been so covertly to go in and change the NAD process from being fair to being just a company review now. I mean, that's my opinion, that it is strictly just like a company review. Okay, that's, I'm getting off my soapbox. Quentin, you, <laughs> you can give yours on that. That's, I just. <laughs> well, I, th I think the, I think the, the law needs to be changed because Let's say, Benny, for example, you know, the farmer has a good day because they, they got a great representative named Benny and they, and they win, right? And the agency says, okay, we're not gonna, we're, we're, we're gonna let this stand, okay? And, and this, is, this is a real live example. Let's say that the farmer wins, but he wins in, he wins in June and he finally gets his loan money in June. All right, but the time for the farmer, and I said this before, the time for the farmer to get in the field and spray for bugs is no later than April the 15th, okay? And let's say my, his spray bill in April, to, April the 15th is $90, $90 an acre times 1,000 acres. His spray bill in June is $210 an acre times 1,000 acres. So tell me how it makes sense to give the farmer the loan in June when his cost of production has increased exponentially. And so I think what has to be changed is, Benny, is that there has to be a quicker, uh, there has to be a quicker appeal, appeal process, meaning we need to get to, bottom, to the bottom of this within, within 10 days because if you wait late in the season and you try to farm the same way in April that you that you're farming in June, it just does not work. Any other <laughs> business, maybe you can catch up with the farming. It just it, you know you have a different you know a bug has one level of resiliency in April. By June, that bug is very strong and it takes a stronger spray at a higher cost. So what you're saying is that the delay takes a feasible positive loan and turns it essentially into predatory lending where they know the farmer is not able to pay it back. And it, nothing changes in the paperwork. All that happens, all that changes is the timing. That is correct. And at the end of the year, when it's time to pay that loan back, his crop yield is gonna be so low that 70% of the loan will be left unpaid and he's going to go into foreclosure because the crop yield, you know, your loan payment, right? When you do your, uh, your feasibility study and your farm plan, it's all based on, you know, average yields. But if your average yield uh, is reduced by 70%, you're going into foreclosure. You will lose that farm. So let me, let me, I'm sorry, go ahead. Ben. It's even more dire than that because you need your tax return before you file your application because they're going to they're going to want that information. So let's just say it's it's February when you get your you know your taxes back before you can go in and file your application. The agency has sixty days to review your application. If they use that time, you know you're you're into uh, March and April. We're in you know somewhere between March and April. If they deny it, then you appeal it. You have, you're guaranteed an appeal hearing within 45 days. 45 days, that's putting you in, you know, well past G. Then you have a, you have a hearing. 
the administrative judge takes 30 days, has 30 days to make a decision. You get a favorable decision, you win, but you lose because it says that it actually also says that the regulations say that the agency has to make decisions based on current financial information. So you've gone past that 90 days. So then they come back, you've won. They come back and ask for new information, new financial information. You haven't been able to put in one of the crops like Quinn was talking about. You know, you're, you're in the, the August now when you've got a favorable decision. You haven't been able to plant crops. You can't get insurance on any crops you plant in the lake. So you, they deny you on feasibility then. You won the appeal that they were wrong. But then with the, the new information that is required, they can deny you. And so then they can you right into a revolving door. So let's go another step further. A person loses the farm and it's, they lose the farm because of nefarious activities. They violated the regs. They didn't get their appeal rights. They didn't get the servicing they were supposed to. But the farm gets sold. Is there anything that brings that farm back? Well, we earlier, we earlier uh, Scott talked about, you know, the prayer meeting, you know, or the prayer meeting in the Bible study. But under the American system of real estate, once the farm goes into foreclosure and it's bought by a third party on the courthouse step, then title is legal title rests in the new owner who bought the foreclosed farm on the foreclosed on the courthouse step. So, uh, you know, we all have good good hearts. We believe in prayer. We believe in the Bible, but an illegal foreclosure that's been sold to a non-interested third party does not get you your farm back. And so this goes to the whole purpose of why we're having this call. You know, and most farmers are trusting people. They'll help you if they can help you. And even if they can't help you, they'll still try to help you, right? But once they get treated like this and, and you know, you got strands of discrimination and unfair treatment, these farmers don't, they, they they don't want any other type of living. They would rather just, and, and, and I don't know all of the stats on farmer suicides, but it, it, the numbers are real. They are committing suicide because, um, be, be, because they're being unfairly kicked off the farm. So once, uh, so once that hammer comes down, once that gets sold, it's gone. So what you're left with, and let's move on into the, um, um, so what you're left with is a situation where the farmer is, has lost the farm. What is that like for a person to stay in that community after a situation like that has happened when there is no getting that farm back? Hmm. Well, I, I'll, I'll jump on this real quick. And, 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 you know, farmers in rural communities, you know, Sometimes they're school teachers, sometimes they're sheriffs, sometimes they are pastors and preachers of, of congregations, you know, very prominent people, right? And once you lose the, lose the farm, you know, you have, you know, once again, you have this target on your back, you know, you know, bad finance, you know, they can't handle their finances, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, it's 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 they're they're embarrassed. They're ashamed that they like Benny said about the young man that is in danger of losing the family farm because of because of a bad loan transaction, right? And so, you know, who who wants to stay behind in this community? You know, in this level of embarrassment, when on their way, and this goes to your point, Scott, and you can probably tell it better than I can is if, if I have to drive to church every Sunday and go past the family farm, I'd rather go 50 miles around the other way than to, than to face this, you know, you know, the sorrow of driving past the family farm, you know? Um, hi, this is Savvy. Um, Quentin and I and um, some students at, um, Oh, not Eastern, um, in the fall, discuss a case that he, he, I think he's still currently working on. 
in Colorado, and it's a case in which you one would say local committee men and um, FSA kind of ganged up on this farmer. And I, I just think because it's a hemp case and it involves equitable relief that perhaps flag it, Quentin, um, for folk on the call so they'll be able to um, get some sense that in the real, that even with the, the, the so-called much touted um, belief that hemp um, is gonna somewhat assist farmers to move uh, forward, that you still have these vestiges of racism and oppression within these farm communities that will seek to derail um, farmers, people of color farmers from positioning themselves to take advantage of this emerging opportunity of hemp production. So yeah, could you comment on that case, Quentin, without, you know, revealing, of course, the name, but I think- um, Well, this, that case, that case, uh, that case dealt with a, with a with a uh, minority farmer who a minority farmer who's been around for a long time is very uh, very prominent very prominent farmer but he just happened to be a minority right and so and and a wealthy and a wealthy farmer and so this farmer was given bad information and we talked about bad information uh, earlier today. Uh, he was given bad information by the government agency and the gov and the bad information placed him in jeopardy of foreclosure. And so what we argued in that case is that the, the, the government agency made a mistake, whether that mistake was intentional or, or, or not. And that, that mistake caused the farmer to face, uh, the jeopardy of foreclosure. So we argued equitable relief. Uh, the the AJ the AJ administrative law judge said that uh, said that he didn't have the authority to grant equitable relief, but he said the AJ said in his opinion that I see that there's an error, <laughs> and these type errors don't happen unless there's something uh, unless there's something funny going on. And what what happened, and you know, the end result of that case is that rather than uh, place the farmer in foreclosure, the the agency removed the threat of foreclosure, and sort of made the farmer whole without ruling on whether or not they made a decision or not. And so um, that's why we have to. Uh, that's why we have to uh, uh, argue these cases. Uh, fight every one of them that we can because when we do that, we send a message around the FSA, USDA system, and the private lending system that there are advocates out in the field who know and understand these practices, Scott, and that we're willing that we're willing to fight back, even though we have limited resources. Uh, but 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 you know, it's not about the size of the dog in the fight, but it's about the 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 fight in the dog, right? And so, uh, and so we're, we, you know, we, you know, this is tough work. It's difficult work. It's depressing work. But we're making, we're making progress. We're really making progress. So, Scott, when we're talking about them, there's one thing we found out, and you were involved in a meeting we were in in D.C. And one of the things we found out was that if you can go up in the, we appeal. We can go in up right to the appeal if the agency withdraws the adverse decision. That doesn't get reported into the national reporting data. So it doesn't show that there was an adverse decision that was overturned for that, you know, that loan, loan officer. We had five back to back to back that they were we got to end the appeal and they withdraw the adverse decision. 
and but they still have gotten delay in and they come back and reduce the amounts of the loan well for the farmer you know we're representing the farmer still the best thing in a lot of these cases is we know if we appeal that again he's going to be completely out and they're forcing the farmer to accept less than he was entitled to in withdrawing the adverse decision but it's that information is never getting to the national office is what we found out and that's what we're trying to get changed but that's just a tactic that the the agency has found that little niche that they can go in and they will follow it right up to one of the farmers we had the agency just said we stand they were going to put on their presentation they said we stand on our decision and we're going to let that farmer go down the tubes except when we put on our presentation they stopped you know when we were about three quarters of the way through they stopped so that they could withdraw the adverse decision didn't want any more theft you know in the record uh it's, it's just amazing you know how the agency develops themselves too to come in and keep punishing farmers when they're supposed to be helping farmers so so i want to i want to take a second and say what what you're and it's it's not across the board but certainly we're talking about a series of situations where if a farmer shows any weakness or has any vulnerability it is used against them where the people that are supposed to help them are hired our our taxpayer dollars go to help them are actually using those opportunities and using their knowledge of the regs to take the land away often at their own personal or community benefit so let's bring this back to the where we started the conversation and where we're starting with this for a farmer who's been through something like this and what we've laid out is that it's often very unfair very powerless very much huge losses with nothing that they can do about it and very very limited redress what is that experience when they come out the other end of that when they are off the farm when they are gone what is that experience what is it that people are going through over and above just the um we know that there is a huge amount of emotional impact based on farm loss anytime you're going to go through that but how does this sense of betrayal change that sense of farm loss and what does it add to it how is it different in a situation like that than just, I, I hate to put it as normal, but the, 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 the well-documented impacts of farm loss on mental health issues. Well, well, well Scott, is, you know, when you, were, when you were framing your question, what comes to mind is who's gonna own this farm after the, the, the heritage or the historical family has been there. And it's most likely some corporate farm uh, that, that, that already has 3,000 acres. And now that, you know, either discriminatory or not, they have access now to another 1,000 acres from the farm that was foreclosed upon. You know, and we're talking about discrimination, right? And so do you think this... 5,000 or 10,000 acre farm is going to be a sustainable farm? I don't think so. It's going to be a corporate farm and it's going to use more chemicals and, you know, it's going to use more, more, you know, dicamba and other sprays that, that, that destroys the environment. And, 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 you know, we know some of the studies where this stuff is showing up in actually the foods that we eat. You can actually trace it, trace the dicamba to the cereal that you eat in the morning, right? And so once you destroy the family farm or get them off, get them off the land permanently, then you're gonna have a larger corporate farm that 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 fills in in, in that void. And in order to have a corporate farm, you gotta have uh, you gotta have your tra traditional row crop practices. And you can't have a big traditional row crop farm without without all different types of chemicals. So basically you know, the reason we have to fight this, yeah, we're, we're here to protect the mental health and the physical health of farmers, but also at the same time, by fighting this battle, we're protecting the food system. 
because, you know, a smaller family farm, you know, they're going to do their best uh, to protect the land, to protect the food. And they, they are closer, you know, from an emotional and, and from a uh, uh, intellectual process, they are closer to providing wholesome food that doesn't have a whole lot of chemicals on it. But a corporate farm, no, it's about profits in the bottom line. So it's a different, a different system that we are promoting and, 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 and helping to advance when we allow these foreclosures to take place. I'm going to bring up something that I saw yesterday, I think, that's kind of, it's, it's kind of under the radar to me when I see it's, it's a bill and it's a good bill because it is to streamline some loans. But it actually was calling small loans up to $2 million. And you had uh, a payback of 15 years. Large loans went to a different category. You were allowed uh, 20 years. Why would you allow, it's supposed to be, you know, we've been taught, you know, there's the efficiency of scale. These big farmers are more efficient, you know, so that's the good thing, you know, they're able to supply this food. If they're more efficient, why do you give them more time to pay back a loan? Because it's still a, a scale. Why would you go from 15 years to 20 years for them to pay back and give them an unfair advantage into competing with the small farmer? I don't, you know, this was, a, to me, some of these unintended consequences. That is a great bill. I like it. But, you know, it's just proposed right now. But to me, there's some of these things that, you know, are ingrained into our society right now that it seems like that everything slips in to help the big farmer. Uh, and we've got to be on, you know, on our alert to, to spot this stuff and, and, and I think the advantage should go to the small farmer, not that big farmer. It should have been reversed. It should have been that the big farmer had 15 years and the small farmer had the 20 years to repay. Uh, I just don't understand, you know, how some of that stuff keeps slipping in into our society right now. So I'm, Benny, I'm reminded of that line that came out of the 80s farm crisis and a bunch of y'all, which is, you know, if things keep going the way they're going, one guy's going to farm the whole country and his wife's still going to have to work in town to buy groceries. And I apologize for the 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 um, the gender stereotypes because more and more farmers are women now, and I I apologize for that. But that was 1980s. But but their 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 spouse is still going to have to work in town to buy groceries. Um, let me ask a different question. If you were a, if you were a person who was a mental health practitioner or a physician or a um, or someone who was not from the farm community and a farmer who had been through the kinds of things that you're talking about came to you for assistance. And you knew sort of some of the simpler, you know, the, the, the standard treatment on some of those things. What would you want them to know about the betrayal dynamics that we're talking about here? If someone was gonna assist farmers or give them help in terms of either mental health or financial counseling or technical assistance or whatever, someone who had been through or was going through the kinds of things that you're talking about, what would you want that person providing assistance to know and be aware of? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, the first thing I would want them to know is that you're dealing with a distressed borrower who, who needs your help, right? And that you got to you, 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 you gotta, you gotta treat them. Um, you know, farmers are tough, men and women. They're very, very tough, you know, mentally, you, you know, mentally, you know, physically, they're very, very tough individuals. But when you get them behind the eight ball and they're facing foreclosure, you gotta understand that, that they really need your help at that point. Right. And, and, to, to directly answer your question is, don't come in with a bad deal, one that's worse than the one I already got. You know, give me something new that's going to be helpful. And, uh, and don't work, don't do anything or say anything to work against them. That's, that's very, very, very short and very succinct. 
don't do anything to work against me. I already have the weather, the bugs, the bank, you know, discrimination. I have all of that against me. I don't need any more. I don't need anybody, you know, I don't need any more problems at this point. So if you're not here to help, uh, you know, you know, keep keep moving is the way I would answer that question. You, you, you use the term distress, distress borrower, and that, that plays out in a couple of different ways. One is that's a category of borrower that they, if a, a, there's an official definition of a distressed borrower, but the other is a personal, this is a person who is distressed. And, and both of you have experience working with farmers under extreme stressful situations. I think um, I want to ask, what's it like working with them? Are they thinking right? How are they, are they able to, you know, what does that mean in terms of how they're interacting with you and able to sort of engage? And, and how does that play out for how people are, how, what it takes to work with someone who's in that situation? These people are feeling so vulnerable when you come in most of the time. You know, they're in the, the worst financial position they've ever been in in their life. They're facing, you know, failure. They have no choices. And that's the way they feel. They have no choices whatsoever. The biggest thing we try to do as we come in is if you can ever work something out and talk with this farmer that gives them a choice, where they start to take a little bit of control, just a little bit, just to make a choice, that, you know, uh, it seems to change the whole dynamic of that family right then. You know, we, Scott, you've been in, we've had them call, you know, that good graces after those meetings, that was the first night sleep they'd have had in months. And it's just because you've tried to step, you know, look back, have them step back a little bit and look, look, we can do some of these things and change and you have a choice. You know, you decide whether you want to move forward, in which direction you want to move. And that's if we get in where we're early enough to get into, especially FSA. FSA has a, a lot of opportunities to work with, with distressed bars. And it's, well, distressed bar is one that's uh, not delinquent, but it, he's going to be delinquent on his next loan. But delinquent bars also. And so those bars are you know, but they're behind eight ball, like Quentin said. But to give them just that one little thing of a choice, and if we can use, leave that meeting, that first meeting with that they've got a choice, that seems to be the most important thing that I've seen that changes the whole dynamics of their, their mental perspective at that time. They can be down, they can be, you know, look like they're really downtrodden but you can really see the life starting to come back in, the blood flow, you know, starting to come. And yeah, they did me wrong. I did have a choice and I'm going to make that choice. And so that's, I mean, that's what I see. You know, and that's what we try to, I, that's what I try to, to accomplish, you know, when I'm meeting with these farmers that are, they are really stressed out. And Benny, you know, you make a very, very good point with, the, with when you say, the choice, they have a choice. And what that translates to in my mind, and I'm sure in your mind also, is debt restructuring. Debt restructuring is not, you know, some phrase that hangs out there that, you know, we make up as we're drinking coffee. Debt restructuring is written in the statute and the agency is required, whether it's a guaranteed loan or whether it's a direct loan, they're required to go through the process of debt restructuring. But Scott, and we've seen this, is that there are different forms of debt restructuring. There are negative debt restructuring and there are positive debt restructuring. And so when you go back and look at the data, it's like if you're, you know, you're black and brown or whatever the case might be, harmful system of debt restructuring. Otherwise, you get a better system of, of debt restructuring. And so and Scott, you made this point earlier. It's not the fact that you were denied a loan. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is once you became a distressed borrower, did you face additional discrimination because you got a very poor negative form of debt restructuring? And so debt restructuring is not a bad thing. Debt restructuring is designed to help you to keep the farm. But 
you know, in the cases that Benny is talking about, you know, the debt, the debt restructuring was even worse than, than the original bad credit terms, you know. So let me, let me just say, just let me, for the group, let me just say that I'm, I'm going to, we're going to finish up this one thing and then we're going to, we're going to go to the questions. Questions are starting to come up in the chat box. So if you have questions, go ahead and get them into the chat. We're just going to wrap this up. But I, I want to, um, like we started out, this is really, um, and, and I also I wanted to bring forward um, Tyler, who works with Rafi um, and has done work with a lot of growers, also brought out, it's not just the destructive, the self-destruction is not just about um, suicide, but can be more risky behaviors. It can be not wearing a seatbelt. It can be just doing dumb things. It can be eating worse stuff. It can be a lot of different things. Um, it's not, it doesn't have to go all the way to suicide, but a lot of accidental deaths, a lot of other very harmful impacts can happen short of a full um, suicide attempt. Um, but I wanted to come back to, um, like, like we said, this, the project that this is coming out of is really about the mental health issues and about the health and mental health issues. When a person, we, we have talked about, we've, we've had discrimination for a long time. It's been sort of in the air. It's sort of in the structure. It's been around. We don't talk enough about the very personal impacts that that has on the people who go through it. And for both of you, I know that both of you have had situations where people were being discriminated against and didn't realize it and had to go through that really painful moment of realizing this is what is being done to me. This is what happened. And I want to understand, I want to get at what does that do to someone in terms of their ability to move forward in a positive way, to, to participate in programs, to do anything else? When, when someone goes through that, what does that do to them personally? And how does that feel? And, and what is that, what happens then in terms of them being able to move forward? Well, I think either two things, two things are going to you know, everybody's going to be angry once you find out in the in the future that you've been treated wrongly in the past. And, you know, you're going to have two reactions, you know. Some people will harm themselves. Some people will harm others. But either way, it's going to have a mental and physical impact on the farmer. And, and to, to answer your question, and as I said before, you know, farmers are really meet nice men and women. You know, mo the ones that I know, they'll do anything for you. But when, you, when they learn that, you know, someone was smiling in their face and saying we're here to help, and then later they find out that they did everything right and that they were discriminated against, you, you have a very angry person for the, really for the rest of their lives. You know, just straight up bitter, bitter individual or individuals for the, for the rest of their lives. Because, you know, as I said before, farming is not like any other, any other business. The, the, the level of risk, the level of uncertainty is just really off the chart. And once they figure out that they've been sweating and, and, and taking on this heat coming off of, off of a diesel engine, you know, eight hours a day, which is very hot. Right. And then to have to learn that someone gave them, a, a worse deal than they gave somebody else. It's just, it's, it's just quite destructive mentally and physical. Yeah, it's, it's creating general mistrust. And that's, that's what's, what's happened that they don't know who to trust then because they've got erroneous information or information that they thought was to help them. Like you're saying, and like, the farmers I was talking with and, and can show them, no, what they were suggesting would lead to this, not, not what they were saying it would lead to. And then they just don't know who to trust because, you know, they had total faith that that person was trying to help them. And they didn't. They discriminated against them. They just were setting them up. And it was intentional setting and so those people are scarred. And uh, like I say, they react differently. But they're damaged. 
So one of, there are a couple of questions. One is about how the pandemic has had an impact on farm loss dynamics. I know that one of the things that we're concerned about is that USDA has moved a lot of their program administration and signed up and everything to online. Um, and there are huge differences in access to uh, internet and technology. Um, but I wanted to see, and you know, are, are you seeing, how is, the, how is the whole pandemic, how is that playing out on the issues that you both work on? And is that exacerbating the dynamics that we're talking about here? Uh, yes, uh, and some of the other advocates who are on the phone can can answer this better than I have because I really haven't followed it as closely as I should have. But during the pandemic, uh, a lot of the uh, timelines in terms of of, of filing of filing a, a civil rights complaint those have been uh, relaxed, so you have more time to file. Uh, say, for instance, Benny, if uh, if you have a, I think they have a moratorium across the board on foreclosures and, and accelerations and defaults. So uh, administratively, USDA has sort of uh, placed a hold on some of these negative consequences. But, uh, you know, we have been working on some language that basically said, once the pandemic is over, keep the limitation or the, the flexibility uh, or the ability to stop the foreclosures and the defaults, keep those in place for the next, you know, year and a half, because it's going to take at least that just to get get caught back up, right? And so if you were behind before the pandemic, you're going to be even more behind during the pandemic. And so, so say, for instance, if you have a moratorium on these negative consequences of not being able to pay the loan back, well, you're going to need, you know, maybe we should have said 24 months or three years before you can do anything negative. Because as you know, Benny, you know, once you get behind in farming, you don't catch up. You don't catch up in the next 12 months. You know, it, it's really, you know, the, ne the next 48 months before you have a chance to catch up because, you know, prices will increase. You got to refigure out where, where your market went and what and where, what your new market is going to be. So a whole number of negative consequences that you have to figure out uh, because of the pandemic. And I think that there's some stuff that is leading to farmers and I think it's going to be a trap for farmers in that when the moratorium is on, actually getting your notices, they're say they must be agency, must be considering uh, treasury offsets as not being negative because I'm still seeing treasury offset letters coming out. I'm still seeing them getting their their notices of delinquency. So there, and that is not, I don't think the notice of, that's an opportunity. You know, it's, in, it's intent to foreclose is what it's saying, but it's notification of delinquency. But they're looking at is an opportunity to restructure. But if you don't respond to that within that 90 days, you lose all rights. And if you think that, you know, that's, that's in the past, you know, because we've got a moratorium on flow culture and you haven't responded to that, the agency is going to be sitting and, and primed to foreclose on all of these loans all at one time when this is over. It is, I mean, it is just, to me, it's scary to see this going on now because I've, I've got a couple right here on the desk right now that just got their notices on the, the notice of uh, administrative offset and the notice of restructuring. So that's moving forward. So they're moving up to that point. And these guys thought they didn't have to respond to any of this because they've heard, you know, that there's a moratorium on all these actions. And if they don't respond to these letters, uh, they've lost all opportunities for restructuring. So we have a question from Anthony about the loans that have the dangling carrot that they may be forgiven. And, and we've talked in the past about that difference between a may and a shall in, the, um, in these regs. But um, I, Anthony, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and send us, are you talking about the 
the bill that's in Congress or are you talking about in the regulations? Um, and so I, um, the, um, and so can, do y'all, are y'all aware of the may be forgiven? This is the bill. I think this is the, um, the Booker bill in Congress about the, um, the, the loan forgiveness. No, there's already, I think he's probably talking about, there's already out there on the stimulus package. If you got the money for, for paying your labor and you can show where you paid your labor, it says that that part of the loan could be forgiven. And I think that I, I'm not sure but that I'm thinking that may be where he's talking about. Well, I think it's, I, I think, um, okay, Anthony, I, um, that, that is what you're talking about. Um, I, I think part of the point here, and this is I, 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 one of the, we spent a little bit of time recently going a little technical, a little more technical than, than I, I, I think we'd intended just going down some of the really technical pieces around restructuring and, and, and um, the, uh, the equitable relief and things like that. And the point of this is that the, um, these are very technical regs. And, and part of what I want to take away from this is both, it's important to get with somebody who understands these things and can help you guide through what these things really mean. The other part of it is that it speaks to this information differential between the farmer and the person on the other side of the desk. That these are very complex regulations, they're very complex things, and um, and, and so it's it, so that has a huge impact on people because they're having they have a very hard time navigating that. So one of the questions that just came up is for each of you, is it is your opinion that the risk versus reward for acquiring financing through federal agencies too great for black farmers to undertake? And are there alternative financing options? So is the risk too high to deal with the agency? And if you don't deal with the agency, are there others that you could deal with? I'll, I'll jump in on that. I think if, if they don't try to access these federal programs, they're going to be at a disadvantage to their neighbor farmers. And normally, FSA and the agency have structured uh, foreclosure proceedings or restructuring proceedings. Uh, other lenders are not, not so. Some of the banks, you know, if we're dealing with FSA, we know what we're facing. We can go in, we know what the regs say. We can go in and we can see if the agency follow, is following regs or is not following regs. With banks, we do not have that option. So a lot of people do not like the agency. Uh, but for me, if, if, if I'm suggesting somebody where somebody's gonna get their money, it's somewhere where there is some oversight. I don't like the data appeals, but there is oversight. We have to exhaust that before they can go to the court system, but it's there. And, we, and, and in some cases, we're, we're going to get information that will help. Even if we lose that, we still get information that would assist in going through the court action. So there is structure with the federal government loan. Brent, um, Quentin? Yeah, that, um, you know, you can, you know, the, the private, the private bank, I think, uh, can be, uh, a more difficult place to operate because like Benny was saying, you, you know, did you pay, did you pay the loan back on time? If the answer is no, we can go straight to foreclosure. Right. But with USDA, the regulations as Benny, you know, articulated so well is there are certain steps or at least we got, we got, I think, Benny, if I kind of think this through, if you, if you came to Benny or myself today and you were, let's say that you were in the fault, there's, on, okay, you got default, you got acceleration, then you got it foreclosure. Am I right, Benny, so far? So you got three steps. 
I can intervene when you get a notice of default and I can buy you another 90 days. Okay. Once I get to, once you get to acceleration, I can possibly buy another 90 days. Once you get to foreclosure, I can buy another 90 days. Right. And then I could go to NAD, right? We can go to NAD and possibly buy another, another six months. And so, so with, with a private lender, you know, you may be off the farm, you know, within 60 days, 90 days at most, but with the federal government, you know, we, you know, just by knowing the timeline of the regulations and the steps in the regulations, I can probably buy, I can probably buy a year. And then when I, once I get to the end of the year, my 12 months, then I got chapter 12 bankruptcy that can buy me a lot more time. Right. And so it's just, you, I'm not saying, you know, USDA is the greatest thing in the world, but you know, at least we know how to operate in the system to buy time to give that gives you an opportunity to restructure. So what we're, what we're talking about here, hearing from what you're saying, and this goes with a comment that Brennan just put into the, into the, um, the chat, is that if you have access to the information or you have access to someone who can help you with really understanding the regs and understanding how to navigate these programs, then you can do it. If you go in eyes open and not just trusting, what's that old Reagan line, trust but verify, right? You know, you, you, you go in, but can have that level of understanding of the programs, then you can navigate it. What I'm struck by is, Benny, what's the interest rate on an operating loan from FSA? Three and a quarter? That's a little high right now, I think. I think it's actually lower than that right now. It's a little lower than that, like two something? And so for two, so an FSA loan is two and, a, and change in terms of an interest rate. A CDFI, a community development financial institution, they're probably eight and a half or nine, right? So you're talking about a much, much more expensive money. Um, one of the questions that we have is about, um, one of the questions that we have is about something like farmer cooperatives or pooling together resources and lending out, a, out lending out pooled resources and things like that. Those things are, can be exciting. And I, I mean, my first take on it is some of those models are really exciting and have some real potential. One of the issues that we're running into is scale. There's about $16 billion lent into agriculture every year. A farm of a mid-scale, it's not unusual for a mid-scale farmer to take out a $750,000 to a million dollar operating loan every year. And that's not that huge of an operation, right? Is that right? right? So some of the challenges with some of the alternatives, like the cooperatives, like some of the CDFIs and other things, is that their lending capacity, the amount of money available, just doesn't match that scale of farming. For smaller scale farming, then you're getting into a whole series of other things that you can that are non-FSA, non-farm loans. Um, Let's see. So one of the questions is, when a farmer is in distress, are they really able to consider and weigh all these options in the middle of that? In the middle of asking for the loan or- No, and if a person gets into distress, if a person's in trouble and they're trying to navigate this, do they really have the, the ability to consider all these options and all these issues and all this stuff? And how does that get navigated? If they respond. Now, that's one thing they've got, you know, we've got to emphasize that once you get that notice, you've got to respond in some manner. You have 60 days on some of it and 30 days. If you get a restructuring package, you know, you've got a longer time to put it in. If, but if you do not respond, if you do not respond to an adverse decision, just a denial, that's 30 days. So, but if you don't respond, you lose your rights and we can't, we can, you know, we're, you're out then. Do not put it aside. Respond. Sooner, so, you know, you know, once again, farm women and farm men, husband and wives, they're very, very strong, independent people. I can do this by myself. I got into it. I can work my way out of this by myself. But to corroborate what Ben just said, respond and reach out to help for help sooner rather than later because 
you know, there's a way to restructure this, right? Then there's a way to force the federal government to pay attention to your restructure because a form of restructuring is foreclosure. Foreclosure is a form of restructuring. But also a form of restructuring is uh, debt write down, right, Benny? You can write you can write the debt down. You can you can decrease the number of acres that you're going to farm. You can uh, you can sell off a piece of expensive equipment and then rent the equipment. You know, take some expensive items off of your balance sheet. You know, sell some assets. But you can't wait to the last minute to figure out what the new business plan is going to be in restructuring. Got to you got to jump on it as soon as possible. And, you know, get with your accountants and get with your uh, farm consultants to uh, to get a, a restructuring plan in place sooner rather than later. And I, I want to recognize that Azebo Turner has put some really, really good comments in the chat about the complexity of accessing, uh, accessing financing, about his experience with going through the negotiations and how in intensely stressful that is. I think one of the things we want to recognize is that to expect farmers at one of the most difficult times in their lives, and, and, and Betty, you said it earlier, I think Quentin, you alluded to it too. When you're in this situation, it's one of the worst times in your life. It's when you're facing your own failure, you're facing your, the loss of everything, often not at your own fault. To expect people then at that moment to learn all the ins and outs of refinancing and restructuring and their credit, you know, their NAD appeals rights and all of these different things and ways to do that is just a it's it's a whole lot to expect and so one of the questions that we are wrestling with is how to give people more access to this kind of technical assistance and having people who are better trained to be able or or more people who are well trained to provide that assistance i, I think it's a good time for us to say if there are if you know of farmers especially in the Carolinas region, who um, are in need of assistance. Rafi has a service, uh, Benny, and then also Craig and Craig Watts and, and Tyler Whitley. Um, our hotline, the, the Rafi hotline, um, and I want to make sure I get that, is 866-586-6746. So that's 866-586-6746. In North Carolina, if you're in need of assistance, um, the Land Loss Prevention Project, Savvy was on from the Land Loss Prevention Project is a nonprofit um, law firm here in North Carolina. Um, they provide excellent assistance. And for people who are not in our region, who might be in other parts of the country, I would hold out the Farm Aid hotline, which is 1-800-FARM-AID. And they have a, um, a, a referral network of people to refer you to. I will be honest and say the number of people who have the level of training that Quentin and Benny are showing today is not that high. We need more people who are able to do that. But Farm Aid can help connect you to folks in your area who can do that. Um, so, yeah, because one thing I want you to bring up, Scott, in it, there is an administrative process, but it's people have to think of it is that when they're going in, it is not a friendly situation because the, if you get into NAD, National Appeals Division, the agency is considered to be correct in their decision. It's not like the court system. In the court system, the state has to prove their case against you. That's not the case when in what we're dealing with is that you have to prove the case against the agency that they erred. And so it is a higher bar and it, that's why it's important to actually get help to understand all of this, that, you know, the burden is on you to prove the agency wrong. They can sit back, cross their legs and do nothing. And they are presumed to be correct. So I want to bring out, Brennan put in a comment into the, into the chat about suicide is a very serious issue, but also there are other issues, increased domestic violence, assaults. Um, and, and one of the things that we're talking about is that this stress, especially when you have this dichotomy, 
you know, playing a game and losing the game, like if I'm playing basketball, playing a game of basketball and losing, that's sad and that hurts. But playing a game and losing when you were cheated against and you were cheated out of it and when the refs were in the pocket of the other team and when the, you know, it wasn't, you weren't given a fair chance to compete, you weren't given the ability to do that, that's a very different experience. And that, in, in addition to the regular farm loss, that, that, that gap between what you think, how the, you think the world should be and how the world actually is can be a very dangerous one. And as Brennan says here, that what we're talking about is that that frustration can go either in, in which case it is self-destructive behavior, which may be depression and suicide, maybe high risk behavior, maybe substance abuse, or it's gonna go out. And that can be um, domestic violence, that can be violence against others. Um, you know, Benny, we had that case a few, it's a while ago now that the farmer took a pistol into the FSA office. This is also where we get into some of the radicalization issues and things like that. So I, I, think, I think having the conversation about having a way for people to channel that frustration and have it be heard is really important. I think he's correct because I, we had talked about before, a lot of the serious situations we go into and it's serious financial problems, there also is serious family stress among the partners. And this is not a stereotype, but it is what I have seen a lot of times. If it's the male, he's off in the back 40, working just as hard as he can. He thinks he's gonna work out of the situation. Yeah. The partner is standing there and they're getting all the calls, you know, delinquency. When are you gonna pay me? When are you gonna do this? And then all of that drives, you know, the stress internally in the, in the family. And I mean, actually, the majority of the cases we go into, we can pick up on that there is family stress uh, in most of those cases where there's financial stress. Easing the financial stress seems to ease the, the family stress among the partners. Um, there's a question here that is about how much the university extension services, especially historically black colleges and universities are working with us to get the word out and provide assistance to farmers. Um, the answer says, well, you know, we don't hear, we don't hear them speak in regards to these issues nearly as much. Um, there are, I know of several of the HBCUs that are getting more and more involved in these issues. Um, I know that there are projects at NCA and T, um, Alcorn, um, and several others that are focusing on some of the exact issues that we're talking about here. Um, but I wanted to see from each of you, is there, do you have a, you know, any kind of um, uh, any kind of reaction in terms of the relationship with the land grant universities? Well, just you know, like you mentioned, Scott, you know, um, you know, they will the the universities, the HBCUs, will get involved and you know refer people to Benny, refer people to me, refer people to Savvy, and and uh, and you know, Flag and others, and especially. Uh, uh, Farm aid. So, um, you know the 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 land grants. They may they you know they 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 come at the issue from a different angle than I would or, or Benny would or Savvy would or even you Scott. Um, but yeah, they they refer. You know, I've had cases referred to me from from the land grants because, you know, they can't. You know, <laughs> Benny and I can fight a different way you know, and we can fight longer and later into the night than someone who's within the, within the land grant because the land grant is federal and is state. And so they have, their hands are tied. My hands are not tied. Benny's hands are not tied. We can fight a different way. But I, I do I, I, I do know that they refer cases and, and, and help sort of walk us through the process because one case that I handled, it was the land grant that provided the, the 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 documents or the or the business plan or the fees or the fees or the understanding of the feasibility plan that sort of helps to build the case to show 
discrimination. So just by looking at their uh, crop report numbers or just by looking at their, uh, what do you call it, Benny, your, 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 uh, your best practices that are written in the research documents, then you can tell if the lender funds best practices for a non-minority farmer and does not fund best practices for a minority farmer, then you can sort of help to build your build your uh, case for discrimination. And so, yeah, we, you know, one case that I that I handled, uh, we we relied on university or the land grant university documents or research documents to to help build the case. So, so yeah, they 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 do help out in my opinion. Benny, yeah, I you know I always use the enterprise budgets that the universities put out in documented you know that's verifiable. And uh, that's what the one of the terms the agency uses, you know, when they're when they're going in. And so we use the enterprise budgets from the universities to uh, parallel what we're showing that you know in in our cash flow that it is verifiable. It's been done through research from the uh, the universities, and the universities we have had the same as Quentin's talking about referrals because. And I'm not sure what they're doing now. I know what the university of extension has been kind of tied a little bit as far as how much help, how far they can go with the farmer. They can show what point you're at. Yep, you're not making money. You're delinquent, or you know this is not making. But they are. They seem to be handcuffed when it comes to giving solutions. And even when they when they tell farmers to come to us or Quentin or somebody else, I think technically from what I've been told, they're not supposed to give individuals, they're supposed to give a list so they can, you know, that they can pick from, you know, that they, they're really, it seems like with the getting government funds that they're really handicapped. We helped an organization that was getting funding and they could do plans for farmers, but if that plan was denied, that cut them off because they had federal funding. And we would come in and represent that farmer because they could not go any further. It, it, it's just, that's just the way it's written, you know, with federal dollars. And we've, one of the things that we've seen is that there are a series of the land grants that have programs around these issues, that may have individual programs around these issues. Certainly, um, two of our partners, NC State is a partner on this project, the North Carolina Agromedicine Institute. Um, uh, they're both are represented on this call, both represent land grants and other universities. Um, and so there are projects within the universities that address some of these issues and some of these pieces. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the concept that when a significant amount of your research is predicated on larger and larger operations, the greater and greater efficiency and larger and larger scale production and larger and larger scale equipment, by nature, that means someone is losing their farms. And we don't, we, you know, by nature, if what you are pushing is farming that a, a single operation covers more and more and more and more land and larger and larger scale and economies of scale, it follows as the night, the day that someone's losing their farm. And so I, I think we are remiss if we don't bring those kinds of structural issues into the conversation at some level. I do want to shout out to uh, Dr. Janine Parker Woods, who's working with us on some on this project. They do have some program at NC, programming at NCANT, and there are some excellent, there are some really good mental health and farm stress based programs at a series of the land grants and some of the best work on some of these issues is coming out some of the land grants around the country. Um, there was one question from earlier in the day about, um, uh, there was one question from earlier in the time about the representation by African-Americans or other minorities on the county committees. Um, I know we did some work, Rafi did some work a few years ago, recognizing that there was very, very little representation on those county committees. Quentin, and Benny, do you have experience with how that, what that means, what kind of representation there is and what that means in the issues that you're talking about? It was fluff. You know, 
it's, it's what I think it was to start with, you know, and it's, it's changing some now, but if you do not have representation from minorities on the, uh, the board, they're supposed to appoint somebody, but the appointed minority representative does not have a voting right. You know, he didn't have a voting right, they were, or he or she. They were there, but they didn't have a, a voting position. To me, that was fluff. Uh, you know, it wasn't real power to come in and help make change. Uh, that's just, I think they, I think, I think I saw where there was some movement to change some of that. And I actually know that I saw something online yesterday, I think it was, it, nationally they were appointing some, uh, on the minority representatives on uh, committees. Great. I think, uh, you know, the, like Benny mentioned, the statute requires that a, there to be an appointment when, when you don't, when you don't have the representation. Um, but in some states that I know of, that representation is being blocked and we're trying to address to address that now. But, you know, I, I don't think I have anything more to add on that other than the minority representation is important. But Benny makes a very, very good point. If the minority representation is fluff, then w you can get the same discriminatory results, who's in, who's out, whether or not you have a minority on the committee or not. So I think you know, the question is, how do, how do we work within our stakeholder organizations to get the right, strong, independent thinking minority representations on, on the committees? Because if, if the minority is, is, is not gonna, gonna fight and push, 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 then, you know, don't, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't expect different results just because you have a, a minority on the committee. And I wanna, I wanna recognize the, um, the um, comments by Stephen Walker, who is one of the farmers on this project, but is also works at University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. Another person put in a note about University of Arkansas Pine Bluff doing assistance with farmers completing USDA loan packages and, and navigating these kinds of issues. And I know Stephen is one of the farmers who, who actually helps deliver those services. And um, Stephen brings up the issue of greed. And um, on a lot of this stuff, what it boils down to, that's a, often what it boils down to, is when farmers are in trouble, greed takes over and folks are able to, to take advantage of that. Um, um, so I wanna, we're coming up on our time. I wanna give both of you a chance um, just to pull it back together. Any final comments around this issue, especially around how it plays out for the mental health and working with farmers in crisis any last comments or last thoughts on this in terms of sort of summing up the day and, um, and, and going forward? Well, one thing I would say, Scott, is, you know, since the 2018 Farm Bill and, you know, we've had a chance to, you know, to argue some of these cases. Uh, uh, we, have, we have some experience on this, you know, Benny and, and Scott and Savvy and others, you know, Rural Coalition, Lorette, we got experience on on, on how to deal with these situations. The only thing I can say is, you know, just with this situation that I just learned about yesterday that I'm gonna help out on is that we know what you, we, we, we know the game, we know the scheme, and we're gonna we're gonna research it, we're gonna investigate it, and and we're gonna we're gonna fight it. And even if we don't have any resources to fight it with, we're gonna pull together everything we got, all the all the intellectual capacity we got, we're gonna, you know, we're we're gonna it's like uh, you remember when uh, President Bush says, uh, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna hunt you down, we're gonna smoke you out and we're gonna get you. So that's what, that's what we do. And that's what we gonna, we'll continue doing. I agree. I had, I had a, uh, we were doing an appeal for, and she was terrified to go into the appeal process because she was intimidated by the loan officers so much. And I told her when we were going in, I said, he's not going to know you're in there 10 minutes after we get into that. I said, he's going to be so mad at me because I'm not there to make a friend. I'm there to win the case. And to win the case, I have to prove that he was either incompetent 
or he intentionally did something which is discrimination. I said, that's the only way I can win. So I've got to go after him. And so he's not going to know you're in there. And we came out, you know, and that's what we came out with because we have to show that. And we attack them so much to show that they're incompetent because you have to show they did something wrong. That's incompetence because they should know the regs. If, and they can accept, you know, if it wasn't incompetent, well, it wasn't. It was intentional. That's discrimination. Uh, it's, it's something that when we get in, that we have to know the person. And I think it is it's crucial when we get in to know these people because for me, I've always said that going in and meeting at the kitchen table with that family, we're getting into the most personal place in that family and they're deep into their finances. It's the deepest place other than their bedroom. And we, you know, we have to share and we have to be a part of what, what they're experiencing in that, in their finances and try to come up with a solution. So we really have to, we have to acknowledge the responsibility that we have when we get with these people and the, and the place they're at in their life is the worst they've ever been in and to appreciate that and really strive to assist them. And I think that's important, uh, you know, to, for us to acknowledge if we're going in, we have to be all in. We can't go in and just pretend that we're going to help somebody. We have to be there because it's vital for them when we, when we get into that position. I've been into some appeals or some situations where the, the farmer really hadn't responded to some stuff and there was nothing I could do. And when I left, they left. And they left the farm. That is terrible. And it was just because they did not respond to something that was there. And there was nothing I could do to, to we just didn't have any, any options left. Uh, and so that's what I, I just want to encourage everybody when they talk to these farmers, when they're getting this stuff, do not procrastinate. Get help, but respond. If they can't find help, respond somehow so that we can go in and argue that they did respond in some manner. Sign that form and send it back. If it's blank, whatever, send the form black. Send the, send the signature form back to them. I want to, I want to, um, I, I think that my lesson coming out of this, if I was going to sum up the lesson for people who are working on these issues, be it the mental health side, be it the TA side, be it the financial side, is what Benny just said, which is, if you're going in, go all in. If you're going to be in, go all in and be there to win because you're, you, you can't go halfway. Um, once again, uh, I'm going to let everybody know if you know, or if a farmer or that you know, or you're a farmer who needs assistance, the RAFI hotline is 866-586-6746. In North Carolina, you can also contact the Land Loss Prevention Project. And for other parts of the country, you can, you can contact FarmAid, 1-800-FARMAID, um, which is 327 six two four three i want to thank everyone for being here um i want to thank and um if, if there are any other questions please reach out to us i want to thank especially two people that i am grateful for having had the opportunity to share the same air with and 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 be able to be to work with uh benny and quentin thank you both very much um and um and thank you all for being here and uh, with that, I think we're going to close it for today. And um, please be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks to the three of you very much. Appreciate you.